Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the roles of insulation this evening, um, sort of bringing it back round to wood fibre insulation and really just run through all the different areas that insulation affects and, um, and particularly how wood fibre um, addresses all those areas particularly. Um, I'm going to go on to talk a bit about clay boards and clay products after that and then talk about um, the uh, training platform that we've created, um, which is a, a free to use platform uh, for anyone to learn how to use wood fiber. Okay, so um, insulation then generally, um, it is because it's by far the most voluminous material, it is, it is one of the, if not the most influential component of a building structure. Um, it affects a lot of different areas. I mean, thermal performance as you, as you kind of expect. Um, that has a big knock-on effect to comfort, obviously, uh, and therefore enjoyment and, and the health of the occupant. So it is really, really important. Now, using insulation and tailoring insulation um, in different ways, you can create a building which is essentially passively looking after itself. It doesn't need a lot of heating or cooling. Most of the work is, is done simply by choosing the right insulation product. Uh, so the eight different roles that we look at are acoustic insulation, fire protection, health, comfort, buildability, which is a big one for any architects that are on here, uh, durability, sustainability and thermal insulation. OK, so starting with uh, acoustic insulation, you'd want plenty of it if you lived there. I think that was coming into Heathrow. Um, so in new buildings, particularly, it's the biggest source of, of complaint. Um, and in terraces or any sort of you know, multi-unit buildings, um, noise is, is one of the things that uh, most people complain about. And it's one of the things that often isn't adequately addressed. So acoustic absorption generally is, is governed by a combination of density and rigidity. So uh, rigidity being a negative thing in this particular sense. So concrete um, would seem to be a good material to use for sound insulation, but actually it's, it's pretty awful and, and transmits sound uh, particularly well. So having quite a dense material, which is fibrous and, and relatively soft to the touch, um, relatively pliable, gives you a material which absorbs a lot of sound. Generally, wood fiber products are between six and 12 times denser than um, synthetic materials that do a similar job. And so, uh, and those fibers are relatively loosely bound as well. So they don't transmit vibration at all, really. So incredibly good acoustically. Um, fire is, um, I was going to say a hot topic, but that's probably a bit of a pun. Um, it's, um, it's generally pretty impractical to build buildings that are completely inflammable. I suppose you could use steel joists and steel rafters and you know all sorts of supposedly non-flammable materials. But if there is a fire, pretty much anything will burn if, as long as you get it hot enough. So it's important to design um, buildings around fire safety and use materials um, that are sparingly flammable if they are flammable, but also materials that don't produce toxic gases during uh, during a fire. So um, PIR boards quite often produce a lot of uh, cyanide gas. Um, the binders used in some uh, glass fibre and, and mineral fibre uh, walls, which on the face of it you'd assume were, were non-flammable, the binders actually produce hydrogen chloride gas, which again is, is incredibly toxic. Um, the thing with wood fibre is whilst the, the individual fibres are flammable, um, because it's quite a dense material, there's, there's very little oxygen around those fibres to be able to actually burn. So if you imagine a book, if you tear a book apart page by page and put it you know, piece by piece into a fire, it will burn relatively quickly. If you put a whole book in a fire, it does take an awfully long time to burn. So um, having quite a dense material with, with relatively little oxygen around, it does actually give you pretty good fire protection. Um, Interestingly, the, the flexible wood fiber products um, are completely um, uh, opaque to uh, infrared radiation as well. So against things like fiberglass, they actually protect timber frames a lot better than fiberglass simply because fiberglass actually lets through infrared radiation. So when you've got intense heat, um, it doesn't actually protect timber particularly well. Um, health. So health, not just for the occupants, but also for the installers. So installers are, are, are subjected to a huge range of construction chemicals and fibres and all sorts of materials. And 
whilst there are um, additives added to glass and mineral fibers uh, to make them dissolve in your lungs, um, there is a period of time that they are obviously in there. And there's also a bit of a query over how long they actually last in your body and what they do in, in the time that they're in your body. So those sort of products are, um, you know, not the sort of thing that you'd want to get in your body. Um, other synthetic materials, uh, PIR, rigid boards, uh, off gas as well, they shrink a little and, and release um, VOCs. Uh, some of that will enter the building, depending on where the, where the insulation is positioned. Uh, and again, that can have uh, an effect on the, on the occupants of the building. Uh, wood fibres and natural fibres generally, uh, they're a, a fairly inert fibre. They don't persist in the body. Your body expels them the same way as any other dust. So, um, you know, they don't hang around and, and cause irritation in your lungs. Uh, and generally don't, uh, don't release much in the way of VOCs either. So uh, wood does actually contain formaldehyde, um, but again, it's, it's quite a small amount and it's normally released fairly quickly um, at the beginning of the, um, the life of the wood fiber, whatever product it is. Uh, so comfort. Um, so our, our sense of comfort is derived by the amount of infrared feedback we're getting from the surfaces around us. And uh, it's not, it, it, by no means is it completely dependent on the air temperature that is surrounding us. So buildings which stay at sort of an even temperature with evenly heated surfaces, uh, we tend to find comfortable. Uh, buildings that are requiring a lot of heating because there are cold surfaces around or a lot of cooling because there are hot surfaces around. Um, tend to be uncomfortable to be in, and, and also the airflow around inside those buildings tends to, to make it uncomfortable. Um, using a lot of lightweight insulation um, seems great on paper, you know, a lot of really lightweight insulation gives you super low U values, but the equilibrium state, so the state um, or the point at which the heat flow through those products maintains an equilibrium level, is achieved very, very quickly with, with a lightweight insulation. And so actually over the course of a day, um, you can get quite a lot of heat through a lightweight material, more so than a, a heavyweight material, uh, even though the U-value may be higher with the heavyweight material. Um, the one thing that U-values U don't consider is um, how long it actually takes to reach that equilibrium state and the amount of heat that actually is transferred in a given time. Um, in addition, um, currently heat kills around 2000 people a year, and that's expected to rise to over 7000 over the next few decades. So the, the way we're insulating our buildings, the amount of time we're spending inside them um, is, uh, is causing a situation where when it does get really hot, people are you know, dying from, from too much heat. So it is becoming ever more important that we design buildings that stay at a, at a stable temperature without needing loads of energy to do so. Um, wood fiber particularly and, and plenty of other natural fibers as well have a really high decrement delay uh, and that is the decrement is the time taken from heat um, hitting the outside of the building or the outside of a roof or a wall to that heat then actually entering the, the inside of the building and the longer you can delay that the, the more stable the, um, the building becomes inside. Um, and the fibers themselves are actually really, really complex. So synthetic fibers tend to be fairly boring, straight or squiggly or, or whatever, but, but on a microscopic level, they're quite uninteresting. Um, plant fibers, which um, mostly uh, what we're talking about, tend to be incredibly complex. They've, they've got incredible structures. The surface chemistry is really interesting. Um, and they, because in a plant, they're generally moving moisture around, they tend to work extremely well with moisture, disperse, store, um, and do a lot, of, uh, a lot of different things with moisture. Um, so this is um, just one example of a, uh, of a passive house. So this is all built with wood fiber and there's, and there is a little bit of heating that goes on in the winter, but there's certainly no cooling in the summer months. So the, the blue line at the top here, uh, you can see the internal temperature. So that's varying sort of on a daily basis of over half a degree or something like that, sort of and slowly going up and down, obviously dips down in the winter, a bit of heating coming on. But given that you've got these huge variations externally, um, I mean, here we're looking at sort of variations of 
uh, 15, 18 degrees on, over the course of a day, um, and you're getting this tiny variation inside. And this is exactly what we're, we're talking about, exactly what we're looking for. So, um, uh, you know, you've got, you've got a, a enormous swings externally, but internally you've got very little change. So it gives you an incredibly comfortable environment. So for the architects, this is not what you want a builder to be doing. <laughs> this is one's about buildability. Um, essentially, for architects um, particularly, but builders as well, uh, we have a term in this country called the performance gap, and that is the difference between the design energy usage and the real life energy usage for a particular building. Um, CABE did some surveys on buildings built between, this is a few years ago now, but built between 98 and I think 2008, something like that. Um, and they found that typically the buildings were performing about 30 to 40 percent worse than they were designed to build. So there is a design to, um, to, to perform that. So they, uh, you know, there's a significant difference. Now, part of that is down to buildability. And if you, uh, if you build a building and you, you know, design it and on paper, it looks great. You know, you can have these perfectly straight lines between your insulation layer and your in, in a leaf of block work or, or you're in a leaf of plasterboard or you've only got a you know a perfectly sealed little air cavity between your insulation and your plasterboard that doesn't happen in the real world on a building site so um any any air gaps between layers of insulation and your inner um, your inner surface that you're trying to insulate uh results in in um, less performance basically so additional heat loss so there was a, a, a study done by Belgian University in 2010 now, it's quite a while ago, but they showed that if there was a three mil gap between your insulation and your inner leaf, so whether that's block work or plasterboard or whatever it is, um, you're looking at about 150% additional heat loss. And with a 10 mil gap, which to be fair is pretty much the standard for, um, for cavity work when you're using rigid boards in a cavity, you're looking at about 400% more heat loss. So, and this is where this, this performance, gap, performance gap comes from. Uh, the other thing about rigid boards, particularly PIR, is that they off-gas and they shrink. So when you're putting them into a timber frame, not only does the timber shrink a little bit, but the boards shrink as well. And although that shrinkage might only be 1.75%, which is pretty much normal, um, over 600 mil, that's a 10 mil gap. So that's quite a significant gap to have around the edge of your, uh, your insulation. So when you add up all those little air gaps, this is, this is where your heat loss is, uh, is coming from. Um, the performance gap in, well, in certainly in some of the wood fiber buildings that we've worked on and, and probably in, in lots of natural fiber buildings, tends to actually be negative. So um, the building that I showed you earlier, the, with the um, temperature graph, that building is actually performing 75% better than even PHPP thought it would. So, um, and that's largely down to being eminently buildable. So the simplicity that you can put a timber frame together with, with wood fiber insulation uh, is, is great. Um, and also there are other, other sort of effects that seem to go on as well. Um, so yeah, I'll skip over that bit, but essentially you've got flexible insulation that goes between um, uh, timbers, so with their rafters or studs, and then you, you would have a, a rigid board on the outside of the building, meaning that all of your thermal bridges are, are covered by that board. Um, and again, it's just incredibly simple. Um, so durability, anyone who's ever done any building, um, doesn't matter how dry all your materials are when they go to site. We live in England where, funnily enough, it rains a lot and everything gets absolutely soaked. So this timber frame was stored off site, was delivered beautifully dry, and then within minutes of it turning up on site, the, uh, the clouds appeared and, uh, and the whole thing got absolutely soaked. So. It's really important that when you're building um, with these kind of, well, with, with timber and with any building really, that you consider that it is gonna get soaked during its construction. Um, you can put a top hat on the whole site, but you know that tends to be quite expensive. And for most projects that isn't uh, realistic. So, um, and again, that isn't just about breathability either. So you can build a, a closed panel system. You can pack it full of mineral wool and, and say that it's breathable and that's great but mineral walls, glass walls don't transport moisture at all. So any water that gets into those panels 
has to slowly evaporate from whatever corner it's sort of soaked into uh, and then work its way through the OSB and it will only evaporate you know at whatever rate it can so when you're using natural fiber materials those those materials are designed to transport moisture and they disperse it incredibly well so if you get um, a timber frame panel with something like wood fiber or, or many other plant fibers they will tend to disperse that moisture through the whole panel uh, and create a much much bigger surface area um, through which to to evaporate so the drying tends to be much much quicker uh, and much more thorough as well um, so in terms of durability, using these kind of materials on site, if they get wet, OK, you don't want to try and get them wet. But if they do get wet, they do dry out incredibly quickly. So one more um, point in, in terms of durability. So it's about the longevity of uh, external wood fibre insulation. So there's an awful lot of um, uh, polystyrene used here, there and everywhere. Um, but on polystyrene, you, you can get issues with buckling, particularly with, with dark coloured renders. And that's largely because uh, with, a, with a, an extremely lightweight and, and very um, low thermal conductivity insulant, any heat that is applied to the surface by the sun um, all goes into the render. That render expands uh, quite quickly. And then if, you, uh, if the sun goes in or if it starts raining or whatever, that then shrinks again. So you're putting a hell of a lot of stress on the... Uh, on the on the surface on the render if you use a, a board which is much higher density and, and capable of, of absorbing some of that heat such as wood fiber um, the transfer goes into the wood fiber it reduces the stress on the render increases the longevity of the render and uh, and, and yeah it, it results in a, in a much better um, installation the other thing is that absorbing some of that heat during the day it prevents the surface getting cold enough to um, get condensation on it overnight you don't get this radiative cooling anywhere near so much with wood fiber as you do with um, eps or, or P, uh, pur so that even on the same wall you can have a, a section with the same render different backgrounds um, and you'll find that with the very um, sort of low thermal conductivity insulators, they'll tend to go green with materials like wood fibre, they tend to stay clean. So we've got on my own house, we've got a, a gable end which is underneath a, a big pine tree, and that's uh, nearly 10 years old and there's absolutely no mould growing on the main bulk of it, except for the little bit of polystyrene plinth at the bottom, which we do have to, to pressure wash every now and then. So yeah, it really does make a difference. Uh, so sustainability, um, hot topic for wood fibre. So generally buildings have got quite a short um, life, you know, design life, typically 30 to 40 years would be pretty good. Um, and then mostly, certainly commercial buildings would be refurbished, generally don't get completely demolished, although the older ones probably do. Um, and insulation is becoming, you know, ever more voluminous, and it tends to be by far the, you know, the most voluminous material going in and out of the building into landfill. So it's really important that we uh, use materials that don't produce a huge amount of energy in their production. So if you use um, a load of synthetic materials at the start of uh, a building's life, you get this what's called a carbon burp. So you get this huge amount of CO2 produced, just producing the energy, uh, just producing the materials to build the building. And then admittedly, the building you know, will have low running costs. But at the start of the building's life is when you want to be saving as much energy as as much CO2 as possible so that your impact over a particular time is actually reduced. Um, using plant fibres, you're using a plant which has soaked up CO2 uh, and, um, and when you incorporate that into the building, you're obviously locking that into the building. Um, typically, uh, wood fibre produces roughly about half the CO2 of, um, uh, of mineral fibre and depending on which type of wood fibre, it can either be um, about the same as, as mineral fiber or two to three times more than mineral fiber. But uh, that doesn't include the, um, the CO2 that's been locked up. So when you actually include that, uh, you'll find usually that wood fiber and uh, certainly different types vary a bit, but generally you're looking at a carbon negative material. So that, that carbon negative material that you're locking in, A, it hasn't produced CO2 in the first place, 
and B, it can help you offset some of the emissions from the other materials you're using in the build. So, um, you know, these kind of plant fibres, um, plant fibre insulations are really critical to reducing our emissions right now and not uh, reducing our emissions, you know, from here for the next 40 years or whatever. You can get both in the same building. Uh, and then finally, uh, thermal insulation. So, again, thermal performance is, is largely focused on thermal conductivity, but it's a bit like saying to a well sheep farmer that, you know, um, sorry, the, 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 best car on the, the best car on the road is the fastest car. So, you know, you can't just say the best insulation has got the lowest thermal conductivity. You give a, a Ferrari or a Bugatti or something to a well sheep farmer, they're not going to get around their fields very well. So it really is horses for courses. In some places, you might want a really, really low um, conductivity, lightweight insulation, but not always. Um, and the decrement delay that I was talking about earlier uh, is a really, really, really important point. And if you take two buildings, same U value, one with very lightweight insulation, one with heavyweight insulation, you will, uh, and you run them same occupancy styles, you'll find that the heavier weight insulation can use anything up to 25% less heating than the lightweight insulation uh, building. And that's simply because uh, the heat storage of the insulation helps store heat during the, normally during the spring and, and autumn, stores it during the day and radiates it back out at night. Uh, and prevents the building overheating during the day. If you use very, very lightweight insulation, you can find that the building gets actually quite hot during the day, that heat will tend to be dumped. And, uh, and then obviously you've got to then produce heat in the evenings and overnight to keep the building warm. Uh, so that, that mass has a, a big um, uh, impact as well. The other thing is psi values or C values. Um, the way that wood fiber is put together results in Psi values being very low. Psi values are effectively the additional heat loss around junctions. So when you're looking at when you're doing a, a SAP score for a house, you're looking at the mid panel U values, for example, middle of a wall, middle of a window, middle of a door, whatever. But that doesn't take into account the additional heat loss around the perimeter of the window or in the corner of the building. And so that's what psi values uh, incorporate. Uh, right, so this is um, this is uh, a true back to earth style. Um, uh, oops, sorry, I don't think I'll need that one. Um, a back to earth style <laughs> experiment here. So we took a polystyrene box and a wood fiber box, both with the same U value. We put them both outside overnight and let them cool down, and then brought them back into the building. So um, it was twenty eight, uh, sorry, twenty point two eight degrees inside the building. And although it was, about, it was about three or four degrees outside, the um, polystyrene cooled down to 5.6 and the wood fiber didn't seem to get that low, so it stayed at 6.48. But anyway, when we brought them back in, uh, within about half an hour of bringing them back in, the wood fiber has risen up by 0.8 degrees and the polystyrene has risen up by eight degrees. So, you know, that's a huge difference. The boxes were identical in size. Everything was identical about them except for the material. And so you can see quite clearly there that the difference that having a heavyweight insulator makes on the internal environment. So again, after an hour, you've gone uh, 11 degrees in the polystyrene and two degrees in the wood fiber. Um, I think this one is, this is just a quick video to show how quickly the, the temperature goes up in the polystyrene and how it's a much slower and more, more gradual process in the, uh, in the wood fiber. And even after, I think it was five hours, the, um, the wood fiber is still three degrees cooler than the, than the room inside. So that thermal mass really does make quite a big difference to the experience inside the building. Um, it is the evening, so I won't go on about this too much. It's possibly a little bit, <laughs> a little bit um, technical, but generally just to say that um, these properties come from the, the structure of the, uh, of the wood fiber. They are incredibly complex, the way they're held together, the, the shape of the structures inside the fibers is, is incredibly complex. And that gives you this, this really interesting interplay between water molecules and the surface of the, uh, of the wood fiber. And so you can get huge amounts of moisture storage without any sort of change in the thermal or physical um, properties of the, of the material. 
Um, it allows you to store liquid as well. So if you do get um, uh, condensation at any point, the, the wood fiber can cope with that storage. Um, there is a, an additional process that, that goes on only with internal insulation on masonry as well. So we found that generally you can get a pretty much a 25% uplift in thermal performance when you insulate the inside of a building. And that we think is to do with um, a phase change process that goes on between water vapor and liquid water where you get this sort of small amount of interstitial condensation on the inside of a wall when you when you insulate it internally. Um, it doesn't happen in timber frame and it, actually as you increase the thickness the, the effect doesn't particularly change either so it, it seems to be just a single process that happens at the surface. So that's uh, another interesting one but again that doesn't come into building control. Um, the specific heat capacity is quite interesting as well. It is very, very high and, and second only to water pretty much. Um, so again, and actually that is increased by absorbing a bit of um, water vapor. So again, having a little bit of moisture around in the structure is, is um, quite useful. But because of that, the, the way that it deals with moisture, it does make wood fiber incredibly useful for retrofit because retrofit, the, the one thing you obviously have to work on a lot is, uh, is how you deal with moisture. Okay, um, so for those of you who don't know, probably many of you do, but I'll quickly whip through it. So there are basically three different types of wood fiber. So there are two different types of boards. So there's a wet process board and a dry process board. And then the flexible wood fiber is, is what's called a thermally bonded non-woven process. Um, and I'll quickly whip through those. So wet process boards are made a bit like paper, really. So you, you take all your waste timber, you chip it up and turn it into uh, you know, quite a small material, it goes through what's called a refiner, which grinds it up into the individual fibers. And then that's mixed with water and a few other chemicals to, to disperse it and, and break it down further. Um, that's put onto a, a sieve um, normally and, and then compressed to, to dry it. And those normally come out about 20 to 25 mil uh, layers. That's then steamed to melt the lignin, the natural lignin around the fibers, which bonds the, the layer together. And then those layers are laminated up to give you whatever thickness of board you're looking for. Uh, with the dry process boards, you're taking the same material, you're drying it uh, and, and refining it, but then you're, you're blowing in a polyurethane resin. Uh, and then you're, again, you're um, putting that on a conveyor belt and compressing it to the right thickness and density. Um, there is a, a small amount of curing there, sort of gently steam cured, uh, and then again, that's machined. But those boards are made at whatever thickness you want to make them, so there's no need to create a, a 20 mil layer and then laminate it up. You just simply make them as a homogeneous single board at whatever thickness. Um, oh, uh oh, <laughs> why is my oh? There we go. Oh, that was worrying me. Um, so flexible wood fiber, again, similar process. You take your, um, your wood fiber, you grind it up, and then you blow it with a polyester fiber. That's uh, called a bico fiber. Um, and you, you create this kind of woolly material. And then you heat that uh, and compress it to the, to the right thickness. And the, the polyester fiber melts and glues the, the wood fibers um, together. So basically, I don't think there are any um, flexible uh, natural fiber materials that don't use polyester. So it is, it is used pretty widely and it's pretty much the default way of producing flexible um, fibers, uh, flexible insulation. So um, fiberglass and mineral fiber too. Uh, on this building, you can see where the wood fiber is used. So in the walls there, you can see the, the insulation uh, in between the timbers. Another interesting point about the flexible wood fiber, it's quite a firm product. So when you press it in between timbers, you'll find that with really lightweight um, glass fiber, mineral fiber, the really super low conductivity ones, when you press them in, they go pretty much squash flat. And so you actually have to, if you don't think about it, you actually need to pull them back out again to get them to uh, occupy the whole void that you're trying to fill. Uh, with wood fibre, you definitely don't get that. It fills the void quite nicely. It's actually quite difficult to over compress it. Um, and, so, and it also doesn't slump because it's quite a rigid material. Uh, you can see the boards on the roof, a couple of different types of wood fibre there. You've got, that's all wet process, but you've got a, a square edge board and then a, um, a tongue and groove board, which goes over the top. Uh, and that's actually the building that I'm sitting in at the moment, that's our office. 
Uh, so the uses generally the boards, whether they're wet or dry, are used for uh, roof wall or floor insulation. Uh, the flexible wood fibre is generally only used between timbers uh, and it gives you a friction fit. Um, so it can be in floors, it can be in walls, it can be in roofs, but it is generally only ever between timbers. Um, so a few details, a few typical construction details. Uh, the one nice thing you can do with wood fibre is build an undented, what's called a hybrid flat roof. So you can insulate between the joists, you can insulate on top of the joist, put your ply or OSB or whatever on top, and then a, um, and a, a sort of synthetic material on top. So you can't do this with green roofs or metal roofs, but you can do it with EPDM or bitumen or GRP or whatever. Um, and that's that's uh, a quite an, uh, an interesting way to do flat roofs. Um, general eaves detail, so again, timber frame walls with boards on the outside. Generally, boards are used on the outside because they absorb a lot of heat. So it's not so much about keeping you warm in the winter, it's more about keeping you uh, cool in the summer. So those boards will absorb most of the day's heat. They'll keep it on the outside of the building and they, um, uh, and then overnight they will radiate that heat back outwards, which obviously keeps the interior cool. So fabric um, uh, gains are, are generally very, very low with wood fiber construction. Uh, and then a fairly sort of standard plinth detail where you've got um, externally insulated um, lightweight block plinth, timber frame, wood fiber board on the outside. We tend to recommend people insulate the service void as well, which admittedly does restrict your ability to put more wiring and stuff in, but it does give you a much better sounding building. Um, the office that I'm in now, we didn't do that. And every time I touch the walls, I hate the sound it produces. Uh, the, the, the insulation um, cushions the plasterboard, as well as giving you more insulation, obviously. Uh, it cushions the plasterboard and gives you a much better, much more solid sounding building. Uh, right, so... I'll quickly move through this. So typically, you know, when you're building extensions and, and fairly standard construction, 140 frame is, is pretty default, 140 or 150. Um, you can put 60, 80, 100 mil boards and get you U values between about 0.2 down to 0.16. So for extensions and that kind of thing, that's that's pretty good. When you're going for um, new buildings or anything towards passive house, you're generally looking at a 200 mil timber. Um, I just say generally we recommend that you use about one third uh, wood fiber board and about two thirds flexible wood fiber, which gives you a good balance between uh, the U value and also your ability to keep the building cool in the summer. Um, I think I've explained why wood fiber is so useful, so I went <laughs> off on about that, but um, it, it's tempting to go for these sort of very thin insulations because we tend to focus on on wanting very thin structural elements uh, and you know not taking up much space and that kind of thing but actually they just tend not to build buildings that you really want to be in so every other metric uh, natural fibers wood fibers outperform synthetic fibers the only one is that thermal conductivity that that is obviously much higher in, in natural fiber than PIR and, and similar things. Um, the decrement delay is generally anything between four times as much and twice as much, depending on what type of material you're using. So again, you keep your building much cooler. Uh, and uh, as I said, the, the heat storage in wood fiber typically is about 12 times more um, than PIR and, and EPS. Um, and we've gone through that a bit as well. So, I will move on to clay boards. So these are um, quite a, a useful material when, certainly when you're working with timber frame. Um, again, for acoustic insulation, the wood fiber does well, but these take it to a whole new level. Um, so move on one more. Um, so it is, it's a, it's a really useful way of making lightweight buildings behave like masonry. So even in a masonry building, the actual penetration of heat over the course of a day only tends to be about 30 to 50 mil into the surface of the masonry. So um, on a daily basis, having you know, really thick, heavy masonry walls uh, to use for thermal mass is, is not necessarily that useful. Um, you can use a, a 25 mil sheet of, uh, of wood fire, uh, sorry, wood fire, of clay boards to give you 
not exactly the same, but very similar uh, sort of thermal mass. And so you, you create a, a much more thermally stable uh, building than you would otherwise. Um, the clay boards are also really good acoustically. So again, going back to the density and, and rigidity um, issue, uh, they're, they're very, very dense. They are quite heavy boards, but they're relatively soft. And, and again, just really do not transmit vibration well at all. Um, on, a, on a stud wall, you can get up to 56 decibel reduction with a, a sheet of clay board each side. Uh, and that's on solid stud as well. So it's not staggered studs. It's not a double stud wall. That's just a single solid stud wall. Bearing in mind that um, building control requires 45 decibels for a party wall, you know, in this case, you're pretty much twice as good as, uh, as party wall regs just with a solid timber stud. Timber stud. Uh, they're A1 fire rated as well, so they're completely inert from a combustibility point of view, so really, really good for fire. Um, they are, I'll show you a close up in a minute, but they are actually made with um, some jute and, and um, wood fibre in with them as well, which helps bind them together. But being clay and, and some plant fibre, they are completely compostable and biodegradable. Um, the other thing about clay is that if you use clay plasters, clays are very good at um, absorbing smells and pollutants from the air. So um, they're, they're generally quite good for use in bathrooms. Um, because again, they'll, they'll buffer that humidity, that sort of burst of humidity that you get when you're showering or bathing, um, which again helps with um, protecting against mold growth. And they're really useful in areas where you, uh, where you get a lot of solar gain in the, uh, in the summer um, or even in the spring and autumn, and that reduces that, that risk of overheating. So this is a um, acoustic profile of uh, one of the walls, which probably is largely meaningless to most people, so I'll skip on from that. Um, it shows just the, the sound absorption profile. Um, it is quite a heavy board, as I said, so you, know, you do need to think about the amount of weight that you're looking at. It's typically, when it's plastered, it's anything up to about 37 kilos a square meter, so it is, you know, it's pretty heavy weight. Um, thermal conductivity is kind of irrelevant, but uh, and, and being clay, it's obviously very vapor permeable. Typically has about four times more heat storage ability than, uh, than plasterboard as well. Uh, and that would be the, the sort of the denser plasterboard. The, the way that it really gains is the carbon emission. So standard plasterboard would be the light blue block, which is this one. So you're looking at about, um, well, in this case, 264 grams per kilogram of, of plasterboard or 264 kilos per tonne. With the clay board, you're looking at about 64 kilos per tonne or, or um, 64 grams per kilo. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a quarter of the emissions, less than a quarter of the emissions for, um, for the clay board. So again, really, really good way to reduce the initial impact of, your, of the building that you're building. Uh, so that's the board in, in close up. You can kind of see the plant fibers there, hopefully. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a relatively dry mix of clay and the wood fibers um, dispersed out onto a, onto a slab, into a mold, and then it's compressed at a, a huge pressure to uh, force it all together. Um, do that one again. Um, so normally put into position with plasterboard lifts. Um, it's quite a hefty board, so it's normally about 23 kilos per board. So unless you've got super strong shoulders, you probably want to be using plasterboard lift, but this is a project where they've been doing that. You'll notice as well, um, you can probably in the background there see some joists running left to right, and then you've got battens underneath that. So when you use the clay boards, A, they're a slightly weird size. They're 1250 long instead of um, 1200 long. Um, and, and so when you use them on a ceiling, you actually want to put them, put the battens in at 417 mil centers, which is, <laughs> which is admittedly a bit of an odd center. Um, but the other thing, and the, and the main reason for doing it is that, um, if you get any deflection in any particular joist, then that deflection is spread over a much wider area by, um, by battening like that. And so you, you don't get the cracking at, at individual joints like you would do if, if you've got all that movement um, and the boards were, were fixed to a specific joist. So particularly useful in older buildings to spread any sort of deflection that you get in older floors. Oh, it's not working again. A um, little bit of a close up. So this bit, hopefully you can see my mouse wiggling around. 
um, there. So that's the clay board there, obviously fixed to a timber stud. This brown a bit here is the uh, the clay plaster they've used on the surface. That's one uh, one of our clay plasters. And then again, this is a, a white clay finish used over the top. So uh, overall, it's a, just below 30 mil. I think it was about 28 mil that they've got on there. Uh, so it is a good old slab of, of clay. So in addition to that, uh, we also have a clay uh, wall and ceiling heating system as well. So it's kind of much the same material, really, if you look at it in close up. Um, it's again, a very, very highly compressed mix of clay. And I think this one actually uses sizal fiber rather than um, wood fiber, but nonetheless. Uh, so these are um, 30, 375 mil square tiles that you fix to walls and ceilings. Uh, and then you've got a fairly soft pipe, which you run through it and then you plaster over the whole thing. Um, working again. So that's a, a wall installation that was uh, from a project in Henley where they were looking at individual panels. The one thing with this system is obviously you've got to be aware that whatever it is that you're creating is known to be a heating panel and people obviously don't try and screw things into it. So it's useful, um, but it does need to be um, highlighted as being uh, you know, a heating system. Um, and that is a ceiling heating system there. So again, you get the, the, the same benefits as you do with the clay boards. You've got that incredible acoustic insulation. You've got a huge amount of thermal mass. Uh, the other advantage with this is that you can cool because um, clay and, and uh, well, the clay panels can absorb quite a bit of moisture. Um, most systems, particularly gypsum blasted systems, just get condensation on them and so they will cool to a certain extent, but on a hot humid day it's, it's very easy to, to get them dripping with condensation. Um, whereas this system will quite easily soak up, I think it's about two litres per square metre of, uh, of moisture, so it's, it's quite a significant amount of moisture um, before it really gets any sort of, you know, starts changing colour or anything like that, so um, yeah, it's quite a lot it can soak up. Um, right, finally, looking at the, um, the fibres site that we've done. So basically, the, we've created a, a, a training section to our kind of offering. Uh, it's a website called Fibres, and it's all about, really, it's about me regurgitating all the information that I have in my head and trying to put it in a, in a format that um, people can access rather than trying to pick through my brains. Um, so it's all the information that, that I've learned and, and other people have learned over many years sort of put into uh, an online platform and essentially, oh, sorry, issues. Uh, essentially, we've created five different courses. So there's a course for um, internal wall insulation, external timber frame insulation, roof insulation and air tightness, and it's all free. So there's no, there's no charge for any of this. You just go on, you sign up, um, which looks, no, it isn't. sorry, I'll get back one. <laughs> uh, you sign up. Anyway, so we, the, the, the um, platform itself is, is basically 12 modules covering um, comfort, sound insulation, overheating, air tightness, maintenance, all sorts of different things, uh, vapor control. And each of those courses is kind of a, a different mix of all those different modules. Um, now it's aimed really at, at kind of everybody. So it's, it's designed for architects and designers to use. So hopefully there's enough technical information for people to understand how to really design with it rather than just sort of swapping out for PIR or whatever, um, really design with it and actually understand how you put um, a building together when you're using wood fiber. Um, but it's also for tradespeople as well. So um, it's about giving them the confidence to use the product because what we tend to find is that um, being so simple, it's rare that you come across a, you know, a half decent tradesperson who doesn't have the skills to use the products. It's just that they're not familiar with it and, and, the, and the combination of, of skills that they need to, uh, to put it all together. So again, this is um, our attempt at least at, um, at helping those guys understand it so that they can feel more confident about going on to, um, to project. So as I said, the um, you go on, you, you log in if you're an existing member or you, you register a new account, put your details in the fairly simple details. Um, each course has a load of written content with some with drawings, some with pictures, various different bits. 
This is the internal wall insula uh, insulation course, which has comfort sound insulation, resilience, overheating, internal solid wall in insulation, installation, and also a bit about choosing the right systems. So those different modules, um, they are all um, multiple choice questions. So you don't, you know, you don't have to have a, a wordy answer. Um, all of the information is written down there. It's just a case of making sure you read what you're looking at and tick on the right one. And hopefully you get to the end of each module and uh, you get all the questions right. They're not, you know, they're not huge modules. They're, they're generally there to try and make sure that people have, have read through and understood the basics of, of each section. Um, and just really to understand why they're using that sort of product and what the benefits are really. Um, so there's a little um, profile page there. So you, you've got basic details. You don't have to give your address and any particular personal information. It's so literally your name and your email address. Uh, and then you've got a list here of all the different courses that you've done. And um, yeah, hopefully that will be uh, useful to, well, to architects. We can do, you can use that for CPD as well. And then obviously for builders and installers. Uh, they can use that whether they're out on site or whether they want to just look at it at home in the evenings, whichever. And hopefully that is everything. <laughs>